So, for those of you who've missed the last two weeks, and if you have missed the last couple of weeks, I really encourage you to go back and check the last couple of messages out. You'll find them, I think, on our Facebook page. Um, they might be on YouTube as well. I can't remember where they are right now. But you can find them. They're not hard to find. I just want to give you a quick refresh on the last two weeks in Jonah's, uh, as we've been exploring Jonah. So, First of all, Jonah hears a message. Jonah gets a message from God to go to Nineveh and bring them a message. And Jonah's like, nope, I'm not doing that. I'm out of here. And he, even though he knows he can't run from God, he runs from God and gets on a boat to go the opposite direction to Tarshish. But then on the boat, a storm comes up and Jonah sees the storm, thinks, this is horrible. I'm going to have a sleep. Um, That's Jonah's response because he's like, why help survive the storm? Because he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. The sailors work out that it's Jonah's fault the storm has come. And Jonah says, I know what will fix everything. If you throw me overboard, in other words, if you kill me, you'll live. And he was quite happy with dying because he didn't want to go to Nineveh. God rescues Jonah, doesn't want Jonah to die. God cares about Jonah. God also cares about the message that Jonah has to give. So a fish comes, swallows Jonah, and Jonah doesn't die. But Jonah's self-righteousness, because he's so great and Nineveh's so horrible, goes into overdrive with this really holy-sounding prayer in the belly of the fish that makes Jonah sound like he's this wonderful, holy and righteous man and it's all God's fault that everything bad has happened and he's done everything right and it's all um, uh, not the way that Jonah thought it would be, but he's going to um, do the right thing eventually is what he claims at the end of his prayer. And the fish is so disgusted with Jonah and Jonah's self-righteousness that the fish vomits Jonah up onto dry land. We talked about vomiting like a fish last week in particular. This week, as we've just heard, God again asks Jonah to go to Nineveh. And the, the brief summary of that whole passage is really that Jonah goes and preaches a very short sermon. Five words in Hebrew is this short sermon on Jonah's part. This sermon doesn't seem to mention God as far as we can tell, doesn't, you know, it's just like, you're all going to die and everyone repents, which is just amazing. This is the, uh, this amazing minimum effort, maximum results kind of thing. So, um, sorry to pick on a couple of people, but Delene, if you go into university and you tell, start, everyone starts telling students, you're all going to fail and everyone gets amazing grades and goes on to be top of their field, you'd be like, oh, man, that, that's pretty awesome. Wouldn't it be great if it worked like that? Andrew, if you went into art class and told them that they were all hopeless, that they were all useless after one day of teaching and you just gave up on them and walked out and they all produced amazing artwork, you might lose your job, but that would be great, wouldn't it? Like, <laughs> that, wouldn't it be amazing if life works like this, this minimum effort, maximum results kind of thing? Uh, um, those of us who are pastors, we, wouldn't we love it if we just, I mean, you wouldn't love it if we all just came and said, you're all going to hell. <laughs> <laughs> but just imagine if that's what we did, just rocked up in church one day, said, you're all going to hell and walked off. And then all of a sudden, everyone believed in Jesus. And suddenly the church was full of hundreds of people. That would be great, but that's not how it works normally. Seems to be how it works here. Jonah goes for this stroll into Nineveh and says, in 40 days, you're all dead. And he walks out. And all these people repent. Minimum of 120,000 people, depending on um, how you understand the history of Nineveh, could have been up to 2 million people. Um, Really interesting, at this time in Nineveh's history, there is evidence that says that Nineveh stopped going to war at this time in history stopped going and conquering other nations at this time in history, depending um, on how you understand that. But that, um, that's just what my cursory research shows, which is just fascinating when you think about it, um, when you think about Jonah and this event. Now, the main belief that people tend to have, that I've at least heard from others around the story of Nineveh and this uh, event, is that the response to Jonah's message is all down to this powerful word of God, that God chose to take those five words and the Holy Spirit worked in those people's lives from just Jonah's five-word sermon of, you're all going to die, Nineveh's going to be overturned, um, 
and they all repented based off just those five words. And that's understandable because God says, for instance, through the prophet Isaiah, my word will never return to me empty. But I think that limits the work of God. I think that understanding limits the power of God and the message that God is actually bringing to the people of Nineveh. Because Jonah didn't even say, as far as we can tell, God said in 40 days, it's just in 40 days. Jonah doesn't really care about them at all, doesn't really claim, even though uh, we do hear that the people believed God. But what did they believe? What was Jonah's message? I want to put to you this repentance event in a different context. If you knew as a nation that God was sending a prophet from far, far away to come and speak to you, what would you think? And if you knew that that prophet actually really hated you, did not want to come, didn't want to come and share anything of God for you because they were like, no, God is only for us, God is not for you, you are too far from God, I'm not interested in coming for you, to you. If you knew that about that prophet and that prophet ended up showing up, what would you think? If you then knew that that prophet not only didn't want to come but actually ran away and that prophet ran away so much that they wanted to die, they would rather die than come to you, that they got on this boat, went trying to get to Tarshish, this storm came up, that they got thrown overboard rather than repent in that moment just so that they wouldn't have to come to you, what would you think? If you knew that that same God who loved Jonah so much that even though Jonah by this stage, because their gods would have killed Jonah, this God chooses to save Jonah and then this Jonah ends up coming and sharing this message with you, what would you think? If you knew the story of Jonah, that every step of the way Jonah doesn't want to come to you, but God makes sure that Jonah does come to you, that Jonah would rather die and God makes sure that Jonah lives. And this prophet rocks up on your door and shares with you a message. What would your response be? I would think that we are much more likely to repent knowing all of that about Jonah if we were the Ninevites than just someone rocking up and saying, you're all going to die. You're going to pay more attention to the message of a prophet who doesn't want to be there, who doesn't want to help, who doesn't care about you, but you know that even though God shouldn't care about you and shouldn't care about this prophet, that God cares about this prophet and God has sent someone to you to bring a message, you're going to listen. You see, there's the message Jonah spoke and then there's the message of Jonah's life. To put it another way, perhaps a slightly um, uh, inappropriate way, if I can, in this community, hopefully I can, I once heard David Letterman say, every person's life has a purpose. Yours may be to serve as a warning to others. And maybe that's the message of the life of Jonah. That Jonah's life served as this witness to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah's life, more than just serving as a warning, served as this truth, that God is powerful, that God can do anything, and that God cares and loves and will rescue people from destruction. So maybe, just maybe the Ninevites realised that God might want to rescue them. The message of Jonah reached the ears of the king, we heard, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion 
turned from his fierce anger that we will not perish. I don't think it's just five words that caused the Ninevites to repent, but I think it's the work of God throughout Jonah's life that caused them to repent. Jonah's life was the message. This all builds up to two really huge questions that I want to invite you to think about for yourselves. Two two questions that link our internal everyday faith with our external everyday faith. That link our life with God that people don't see to life that everyone does see. First question is this, what is the message of your life? What is the message of your life? Because our lives do give people a message. We might be intentional about the message of our lives. We might be unintentional about the message of our lives. But the way we live our lives, the choices we make each and every day communicate something to the people around us. What's the message that you're sending about who you are? What is the message that you're sending about what you think about others? What is the message that your life is sending others about who God is? I'll just give you some time to think about the message of your life. What is the message that you are sending about who you are? What is the message about what you think about others? What is the message that you send about God? A follow-up question for that one. Are you being intentional about the message your life is sending? Are you crafting it? Do you know who you are and who you want to be? Do you know what you want to have others see about you? Do you know what you want others to see about who God is? Are you and God working together on the message of your life? That's our first question. Our second question is a bit harder, perhaps. Who is your Nineveh? Who or what is your Nineveh? Now, because we're called to be like Jesus, not like Jonah, you might know who your Nineveh is, or you might not have put it in that language, but you might actually be following God's call on your life. You might be knowing, okay, yes, actually, I am called to serve these particular people. I know that God would have me love these people that are around me. I know God has me bringing the message to these people and I'm doing it. But you might also go, oh, hang on a minute. There's something God's asking me to do, but I don't actually want to do it. There's people that God wants me to be with and I don't really want to be with those people. There's a step that God wants me to take and I don't want to take that step. But all of us, I believe, have a Nineveh. We all have a place to go, a people to see, something that God is asking us to do and maybe, maybe even our Nineveh is trusting God in the first place, saying that we're going to follow God, saying that we're going to live life with Jesus, saying that we're going to take another step. Each of us have a call on our lives to bring Jesus to others. And God's inviting us, God's pursuing us, God's chasing us, God's encouraging us, God's loving us, God's rescuing us, not just for our own sake, but that because there's people that God wants us to bring his love to. And we do so not just with the words that we share, 
but with the message of our life. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the message that our lives share. And first of all, we thank you for the message of Jonah's life. We thank you that the message of his life is that you would never give up on your prophet Jonah. That you would keep on calling him back to what you would have him do. That you continually rescue and love and protect and save. Thank you that the message of Jonah's life is that you're reaching out through even people like Jonah to people who are far from you. Father God, we thank you for the message of the life of Jesus. We have all his teaching, all the words that he said, but we have also the message of the life that he lived, the life that he gave for us. Thank you that we can clearly see in Jesus your message to us, that you love us, that you embrace us, that there's nothing you won't do to have us know your great love for us. But Father God, we thank you for your life, the life of your son Jesus, and that the life that your Holy Spirit now gives. Father God, help us to look at our own lives, the life that you've given each of us. Help us to see the message that our life is. Help us to consider how to live well, to live a life intentionally in partnership with you, knowing that you are walking with us each and every day. And we ask that you would help us in whatever our life is, that part of our life's message would be of your grace for us and for others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.